que baile con cojones y suena la faña. Siente tu que cambiando la vaina pa' que muevan los talones. Mami, ¿cuál es la mente? Siendo con la manada no perdemos de repente. Esto es mucho piquete con lentes. Mirando culos impacientes, no importa lo que piense, tus amigas y la gente. Y si tú me quieres, sabes que me mueven la mujer y los placeres. Tenemos los derechos y conocemos los deberes. Pa' dejar las en cuatro y sentir como el que se viene, se viene, se viene. Se prende la vaina y el humo pa' arriba me llevo. Poseído y ahogado con alcohol y me pongo sabio. El hígado pidiéndome por favor que le baje un cambio. Jugando distinto, Ronaldo Nazario. Llegué aquí con novia y se acercaron varios culitos tremendos. Terminas activa que tengo a mi radio. Me dio de la euforia, olvidé los horarios. Llegué a casa tarde, pero era temprano. Pupila gigante y un blonde en las manos. Si la ve, si la ve, solo dile que me largue. Solo dile que, que la vaina se prendió. Um, welcome, everyone. Diego, if you want to start us off with interpretation, um, we can jump right in. Oh, yes. Thank you, Josie. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so I'm just going to get started with this quick introduction. So hi, my name is Diego Ponce. I'm here on behalf of the Community Language Cooperative. Thank you once again for having us today at your meeting. The organizers of this meeting have made a commitment towards language justice. This means that we're here to help create a space where everyone can participate and engage in the language of their heart, which is a language that each person feels most comfortable in. We will use simultaneous interpretation today to help create the space. When I finish saying the statement in English, I'll repeat it in Spanish. After this, we'll turn on the interpretation. And at that point, you'll be able to see a globe icon that says, interpretation there in the bottom right hand corner of your screen probably next to your reactions button uh, don't worry because the interpretation is not turned on yet if you are joining this meeting through your cell phone or your tablet please look for the more button or the three dots button in order to select your language if you are not fully bilingual we ask that you please select your preferred language uh, if you are bilingual then please just feel free to listen to everyone in their original language uh, if everyone could please help me out and if someone like joins the meeting at a later time, like after we've turned on the interpretation, please remind everyone just to check the chat box and I'll drop the instructions there just because at that point, people who are not selected to a language channel won't be able to hear me, the interpreter. So help me out with that if you could and I'd appreciate it. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Diego Pons. Y estoy aquí de parte de la Cooperativa de Justicia del Lenguaje. Uh, muchas gracias por invitarnos otra vez a ser parte de su reunión. Los organizadores de esta reunión se han comprometido a servir la justicia del lenguaje. Uh, lo que eso significa es que queremos crear un espacio donde todos puedan participar e involucrarse en el idioma de su corazón, que es el idioma en el que todas las personas se sientan más cómodas. Vamos a usar la interpretación simultánea hoy para poder crear este espacio. Cuando yo termine de decir esto, vamos a activar la interpretación y en ese momento usted va a poder ver un icono de un globo terrestre ahí abajo en la derecha de su pantalla, al lado del botón de las reacciones. Uh, no se preocupen porque aún no está prendida la interpretación. Si usted está asistiendo a esta reunión en su celular o en su tableta, por favor busque la opción que dice More, que quiere decir más, o el botón de tres puntos, probablemente ahí arriba en la derecha de su pantalla, para poder seleccionar su idioma en ese momento. Uh, si usted no es completamente bilingüe, le pedimos que por favor seleccione su idioma preferido. Y si usted sí es bilingüe, por favor escucha a todos en su idioma original 
Y si alguien llega a unirse a la reunión luego de que yo dé esta introducción, por favor, háganles acordar de que chequeen el chat donde yo puedo poner las instrucciones para aprender la interpretación. Uh, muchas gracias. Okay, great. So interpretation is enabled, so you can select your language now. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Undocu Queer Art, a fireside conversation. The second of four events in Homeland Security, Come In Girl, a programming series featuring queer and undocumented artists and art making. My name is Josephine Heston, and I'm the program's associate at Q. Before I introduce the event organizers, I have a few housekeeping notes. Live captions are available in English tonight. If you click on the CC closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show, show subtitles, you'll be able to view them. You can also elect to view a, a transcript from that same menu that will show you more of the conversation at one time. Diego just went over how to access Spanish interpretation, but as a reminder, you can click on the globe shaped interpretation button on the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen and select Spanish to listen to a simultaneous audio interpretation of this program in Spanish. The event today is being recorded. If you're not comfortable with the possibility that your face and name may appear publicly, please turn off your video and rename yourself using an alias. Please keep your microphone muted during presentations. This helps the audio quality for the group. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type them in the chat. And finally, this is a safe space. So please respect the voices and privacy of all of the presenters and attendees. Feel free to private message one of the event organizers with Q in the username during the event if you'd like to discuss questions, concerns, or problems. Anyone displaying inappropriate behavior in any form will immediately be removed. Homeland Security Come In Girl is the winning selection from Q's 2021 Open Call for Public Programs. It has been organized by Anthony Barroso, Varun Qatar, Danilo Machado, and Laura Vieira Ramirez. It's now my pleasure to hand it over to Varun. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Can you all hear me okay? How are we feeling? Can you let us know in the chat how you're doing today. What's your weather forecast? Um, and um, yeah, just love to, to hear, hear from you all before we dive in. Um, I'm curious. Um, I'm, I'm Varun. Again, I'm Varun Katar Sharma. I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. Um, and I'm going to just tell you a little bit about us as a collective and why we're here today um, and before passing it over to our incredible guests um, who are moderating today's event, um, Alan and Sonia. Um, but I just want to just share before, at the, just how grateful I am that we're here six months later, um, seven months um, later after we, Danilo and I had a conversation, I think after one of your DJ sets, um, about the possibility of applying for this fellowship, not thinking that we would necessarily win. Um, and, and then many Zoom calls, again, many Google Docs um, later um, were here. And um, I know Pride Month just ended, but um, we are continuing. I feel like the, continuing that we're continuing to celebrate um, each other, celebrate uh, um, our incredible communities, our incredible artists that you know make us who we are, make our movements what they are. Um, and so I'm just so proud to be part of this collective, along with Danilo, Laura, and Anthony, bringing you tonight's event. Um, and we are. I just briefly to, to share a little bit about us. We're a collective of, of organizers, of artists, of facilitators um, who came together through the immigrant rights movement in, um, in Connecticut originally. Um, now we've sort of spread out, um, but we're still remain tethered to each other, um, you know, and, and grounded in a deep love um, for each other and for um, and um, and also just a deep love for art and for and for the works of people like Alan and Sonia, um, who inspired us, continue to inspire us, um, to hold us accountable, to um, give us hope. Um, and so, so yeah, this is such a joy to be here with you all. Um, I want to just take a moment before we keep moving. Um, Danilo and Laura, how are you all doing? I'm, I'm, I want to put you all on the spot for a second. Um, do you have anything you'd like to share with us before we dive in? Um, I know Anthony, you might be on the on the road, so um, I, I'll um, maybe pass it to Laura first. Um, what's going on with you, Laura? Yeah, thanks. It's so great to see everyone. Um, 
it's been a little bit of a, a hectic week for me moving, but I'm really excited to be here um, and to be able to take some time to slow down and really take everything in. Um, so I'm really excited for this beautiful space. I have my journal ready to take all these notes because I know that it will all flow out all of these feelings and all of the yeah, good, beautiful vibes from everyone. So I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I hope you all have your journals and your pens and pencils ready. I don't have mine, mine here. Um, Danilo, what's going on with you? Um, yeah, I'm also moving this weekend, uh, you know, for the first time in four years. So it's it's going to be a lot, <laughs> but I'm excited to uh, um, to have Varun over. Varun is reporting from my living room. <laughs> Um, and it's so sweet to, um, yeah, to be able to spend some time uh, together after after so long in this in the same Zoom grid. Um, and yeah, really ex excited for for tonight's uh, chat and then workshop afterwards. And Anthony, are you? I know you might be on the road, but are you able to to check in with us? Uh, let us know how you're doing. Um, no pressure if not. Yeah, hey y'all. Um, sorry my video is not on. Um, I'm just making it home. Uh, it's really wet outside, but I'm very thankful and happy to be here. Um, I'm it, just been looking forward to this event and, you know, I've loved collaborating with y'all on this series. So yeah, I'm really happy and thankful to be here. Yeah, and, and I'll just take another quick moment to just um, you know, invite you all to join me and join us in um, reflecting on the histories of the land upon which we currently reside. Um, so I'm coming to you again from Danilo's, not only Danilo's living room, um, but from um, the unceded territory, the Danilo Nape, or also known as uh, Lenape Hoking. Um, also known as, um, or currently or temporarily known as Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, and I wanna just, I'm, I'm borrowing some words from the poetry project. Um, so I'll just read, read this. Um, as we gather across various neighborhoods and states, it gives me occasion to remember that this was not just some of the land that was stolen or some of the land that we needs to be returned, but all of it. Um, it reminds me too that to return the land is not a matter of transferring capitalist ownership, but as many indigenous thinkers have taught us, um, it, it's, it's a radical rethinking of ownership and belonging, centering indigenous autonomy and active relationality and responsibility. Um, and I'd also um, like to drop, or Danila, I don't know if you can help me by dropping in the chat um, a link where you can find out more about the land where you currently reside um, using a map from the Native Di Land Digital Project. Um, thank you, Danilo, for, for dropping that in the chat. And, and, and again, um, you know, I just want to remind us again, as Alan has, has really taught me um, or continue to remind me, right, we are not all settlers on this land. So I'm right, I'm the descendant of South Asian migrants um, who are you know, colonized and displaced, but I'm also, again, we're, we're, we want to acknowledge that some of us are here are as a sense and people who are kidnapped and brought here as property to be sold. And as we continue to fight for the rights of queer and trans migrants here on this land on Turtle Island, uh, we must continue to remind ourselves that there is no migrant justice, there's no queer liberation without the dismantling of white supremacy, of anti-blackness, of settler colonialism, of capitalism. Um, so um, with that, um, I wanna just remind us that we, um, so again, thank you all for being here. I don't wanna take up too much more time, but I'll just share briefly that we are um, really honored to be selling fundraising today. This, this series is also a fundraiser for um, a project um, for Mariposas Sin Fronteras, an organization that um, I, I care deeply about, many of us um, care deeply about, um, that is, um, and I'll share my screen in a second so you can learn more about Mariposas Sin Fronteras and how you can support them. Um, if you just give me a moment. Um, so Mariposas Sin Fronteras is an organization based in Tucson, Arizona that seeks to end the systemic violence and abuse of LGBTQ people held in prison and immigration detention. Um, so they envision a society where they no longer find solutions in the system of de immigration detention or the prison industrial complex. Um, and so we are really excited to be offering 
um, selling, selling these posters that are a beautiful remix of the original poster that inspired the name of the series from Julio Salgado. Um, I'm excited to hang this up in my bedroom, um, and I hope you'll you'll join me in, in in ordering your exclusive copy of this poster. And all of the proceeds will benefit Mariposas Sin Fronteras. Um, so if you are able to, again, Danilo dropped a link in the chat um, where you can go to the Q website um, if you haven't already, and and get your hands on this poster um, and support incredible work. Um, you know um, to you know. About, you know, support our, our siblings in detention and to dismantle the prison industrial complex. Um, and so um, with that, I think that um, I just want to remind us that we are here from until 6 p.m. for this event. And then we also um, will be um, back here half an hour later for a creative writing workshop. Um, and so we invite you all, if you haven't already RSVP for that, um, we'll share more information at the end of um, this program. But we're, we're, again, this is a two part series today. Um, and we hope that you'll also be able to stick around and join us um, after a, a break for um, this creative writing workshop. And so without further ado, um, I'm tired of hearing my own voice. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sonia and Alan, who I really don't think need any introduction. Um, there's icons in our community and uh, we just love you both so much and are so grateful that you're agreed to spend a little bit of time with us. And so um, Sonia and Alan, if you could take it away. Hi everyone. Alan, you're muted. Hello, hello. <laughs> I feel like um, hello, hello. <laughs> I feel like this is like um, bringing two awkward friends on 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 virtual space and to like just share out like some of our things and um, but it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for for bringing us here and uh, and Alana haven't seen you physically in a minute, so this is like amazing too. Uh, not for just like who's tuning in, but like just for me too. No, likewise, I feel the same way. And I'm super excited to be here too, because in my very brief time in Connecticut, I got to spend some time with Danilo and really learn um, from Danilo. Um, I think I always tell Danilo this, but I always feel like they're significantly smarter than me and like more politically aligned. So I'm like, oh my goodness, of course I'll come to an event that they're like co-organizing. <laughs> so um, as, as much as, you know, um, so again, it's like bios, um, and also um, I think that the formality of like reading people's like work and what they have done and the amazing, incredible things um, that have you know like have them arrived here, uh, it's important to name. And so I want to first introduce Alan properly, um, and just a quick bio, just to just to um, make them blush because they are just incredible. Uh, is an Afro-Indigenous poet, installation and adornment artist from Oaxaca, Mexico. Their work attends to the quotation realities of undocumented migrants in the United States, the Black condition in Latin America, and the intimate kinship units that trans and non-binary people build in the face of violence. Their debut visual poetry collection, Intergalactic Travels, poem from a fugitive alien, which you should all get, um, came out in 2020. Um, they're a finalist for the 2020 International Latino Book Awards. They're also the author of the chapbook To Love and Mourn in the Age of Displacement. So you should also get that if you're able to. Um, while they're an artist, Alan has also been an organizer with undocumented migrants in the United States for over 10 years and firmly believes that art is a portal into the future. But which future? That depends on the artists and the ideologies that moves them. You can read Alan's writing on Teen Vogue, the Andy Warhol Museum, Everyday Feminism, Poetry Magazine, and so many, many, many other um, platforms that have had the pleasure of having their work. Um, and just to give you a heads up, we're introducing ourselves and we are gonna be sharing some poetry. So Alan, please bless us with um, your poetry. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, so in thinking of what to read for today, I was originally going to read these like future stories. Um, I am no longer going to do that <laughs> um, because I realized that we're in August. I mean, we're almost into August and it'll be at uh, two years next month 
since the assassination of Carmela Parral Santos, who uh, was an Afro-Indigenous um, leader in Oaxaca and was murdered by the government after opposing a massive proposal to uh, deforestate 13 Indigenous communities in the country. Um, so I'll read this poem and it's titled Chikatanas for Morning, a recipe. Um, Chikatanas are flying ants that we eat in Oaxaca um, and I'll read the poem. Ingredients, the strength of five generations of ancestors, two dozen roasted chikatanas, two roasted garlic cloves, a love for all things black, two white candles, a cup of dry black beans, four tree chilies, quarter of a roasted onion, two adobe bricks, a commitment to indigenous life everywhere, eight roasted coastal chili peppers, water or tears, salt, no salt if using tears, Carmela Parral's photograph and freshly picked mint, cooking instructions. Open Twitter and search ni una menos and you will encounter one of the many afterlives of colonialism in the Americas. Most recently, Carmela Parral. Reader, please search her name and print her photo. On Twitter, Mara Itahi tweets the news. Asesinaron ayer a mi amiga Carmela Parral, presidenta de Estancia Grande. They assassinated my, my partner Carmela Parral yesterday. One woman must announce the murder of another. Reader, please place the chikatanas, garlic cloves, tree chilies, coastal chili peppers, and slice of onion in a molcajete and grind them together. Feel free to add a pinch of water and salt or tears. In this cooking process, you must remember the strength and power of black and indigenous life. You must commit to liberation if you want this recipe to work. Reader, please channel the strength of your ancestors as you grind. Now, take a step away from the Morcajete to open your own Twitter and tweet her name, Carmela Parral. Carmela Parral, tweet until there are no more characters left in the word count. Reader, Please return to grinding and add water until you have reached the ideal consistency of your first salsa de chicatanas. Let the salsa cool in the fridge. While the salsa sits in its aromas, pick up the adobe bricks, place one on its long side and the second flat against the edge of the other. Stand Carmela's photo on top of the flat adobe brick and let it rest against the other brick. Arrange the white candles on opposite ends of the bricks, and as you light them, say her name, Carmela Barral, Carmela Barral. Gather the black beans and offer them to Carmela's village by placing them around the adobe bricks. Search for a small teacup and fill it with water. Offer the water to all the trees the Mexican government is willing to cut to construct the Maya train, which Carmela opposed the reason she was murdered. Approach the fridge, scoop a few tablespoons of the salsa you just made onto a small plate and offer the salsa to all the murdered women, girls, and third, fourth, and fifth genders whose names we do not know. Finally, Reach for the mint. Bring the tender plant to your nose. Inhale. And commit to continue experimenting with life. Commit to care. Please place mint anywhere on the adobe bricks. Dear reader, take this recipe and offer it to others. Encourage them to experiment with life always. I think um, I will leave it at that poem since it's a little bit of a longer one. Um, 
And I will now introduce uh, Sonia to you all. Um, Sonia is a dear, dear friend um, who I'm so excited that we have gotten to know each other over the last um, decade or so. Uh, Sonia Guignansaka is an international award-winning poet and cultural strategist. They emerged as a national leader in the migrant artistic and political organizing communities where they coordinated and participated in groundbreaking civil disobedience actions. Yansaka helped build some of the largest undocumented organizations in the U.S., including co-founding some of the first artistic projects by and for undocumented writers and artists. For over a decade, they have worked in both policy and cultural efforts, building infrastructure for migrant artists. Their migration and cultural equity work has taken them to London and Mexico City to ad advise on migrant policy and art projects. They self-published Nostalgia and Borders in 2016. Their writing has been featured on Colonize This Anthology and This Is Not a Gun. They are co-editing the forthcoming anthology, Somewhere We Are Human. Inyan Saka is currently a Creative Time Think Tank Fellow, National Advisory Board Member of the Laundromat Project in New York City, and a consultant to national social justice organizations, culture institutions, and foundations. But their full-time job is getting their publishing company, House of Alegria, off the grounds. And now I'll give it up to Sonia. Thank you. Oh, I learned that poem. I'm just like... Thank you. Laughing at the comments, uh, somebody said, um, Danita doesn't need an ego boost or need, <laughs> but like just incredible, so much gratitude to the organizers who like allowed us to be in this space today. So um, thank you. I'm gonna, the pandemic has um, given me space to just like sit with a lot of things and process a lot of hurt. Um, and so I just wanted to read this poem I had written. Um, yeah, as I'm making sense of like, of all the things that are happening. Um, yeah, it's called um, Gutted uh, 2020. So we'll do that. One. Split January in two. Somewhere between London and Joshua Tree, I was gutted fish in both places. Crossing bridges, trying to hold my insides together, hearts have fallen onto the river things. Livers have snuck between two boulders in Yucca Valley. Cut down from the jawbone, open, I feel pain below the throat. Often, fishermen remove guts with hands, like baptism, they wash out the gut cavity with water. Like autopsy, they wash out the gut cavity with water, getting rid of blood and organs. Do we call this holiness, grieving, or death? I grip onto my belly button. Everything still gushes out. A liver, a non-disclosure, a bruised heart, and poems. I place right hand, which carries a flower tattoo over my belly. Is this how we adorn the hurt too? How do we split a Gemini in two? In Latin, Gemini translates to twins. There's already two of me. So what broke me further? What is this pain? The pain equals to two pains, two heartaches, two endings, three. In Greek mythology, Geminis are two siblings called Castor and Pollux. One brother during his death asks to live immortally next to his twin. Or was it one brother asking Zeus to let ungod-like brother who died come up to heaven with them? Tragic. Everyone disagrees on the ending. Four. The Geminis, they are regarded as great horsemen and great athletes. But we've lost too many games. Remember as the helpers of humankind, but humans are not kind, patrons of travelers and sailors, but some of us get lost and drowned. Five. In this mythology, empires are built, Romans and Germans celebrate them. Cults of Castor exist in the fifth century. Christianity adopts them in their own biblical storytelling. None of this is sacred. Castor and Pollux replaced by St. Peter's and Paul. All of this makes me giggle. Six, there's nothing glorious about being a gutted fish. 
I am learning to peel thunder. So let me be deity, let me be in thee. I want to be horsemen, go in battle and survive. I want to be Castor and Pollux, brave and immortal or brave and foolish, sail through oceans and not drown in memories. Seven, between drizzles of rain and desert warmth, I do not want to be gutted and tender, not open and rotting. The constellation of a Gemini contains 85 stars. A star's life begins with gravitational collapse. God, I've collapsed 1,000 times unto the underworld, praying to be uncut, stitched up, guts intact, sunrise and sunset. There's always a sky broken in half, feeling everything twice. You split the Gemini by gutting the sky. I feel like I haven't read poetry out loud in a minute, so just, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for, um, for joining us here. One of the things that we wanted to do with this, um, with this like talk between a fireside chat, which it's not really like a fireside chat because there's no fire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted to uplift the, I feel like oftentimes when we're talking about our craft or like about our artistry, um, there's like this push to leave out the community or the ecosystem that we come from. And we wanted to like frame it and just like, um, and ground like our artistry and how we came about um, in, in the ecosystem that nurtured us and nourished us. And so uh, we have a few slides uh, and then we have questions that Alain and I will ask each other. And then we'll open it up for like a larger conversation uh, if people have questions. But thank you for sharing the slides, uh, the tech person. Um, may we go to the next slide? So um, one of the people that I really want, we really wanted us to like talk about is Edwish Tantikat, who is a Haitian uh, novelist, uh, children's book author, essayist, um, and sometimes journalist. Uh, they, uh, Edwish Tantikat has said that she's not a journalist, but she does sometimes publish um, investigative journalism in newspapers. So she is kind of a journalist. Um, and the first time I ever read anything about a Black undocumented person was her 2007 book uh, titled Brother I'm Dying, which um, chronicles the life of her uncle who came to the US from Haiti with a visa and was sent to a detention center and died um, within a week of being in detention. Um, and Edgar Santikat uh, writes in Create Dangerously, the immigrant artists at work, that in a lot of countries, artists are the first ones to be taken by the government or disappeared by the government or murdered by the government, precisely because artists are the ones that um, push uh, communities to demand accountability, to demand change, and to um, offer visions larger than the country can offer. Um, and we have this like small quote. Um, I guess I'll read the quote. The immigrant artist shares with all other artists the desire to interpret and possibly remake his or her own world. So though we may not be creating as dangerously as our forebears, though we are not risking torture, beatings, execution, though exile does not threaten us into perpetual silence, still, while we are at work, bodies are littering the street somewhere. People are buried under rubble somewhere. Mass graves are being dug somewhere. Survivors are living in makeshift tent cities and refugee camps somewhere, shielding their heads from the rain, closing their eyes, covering their ears to shut out the sounds of military aid helicopters. And still many are reading and writing quietly, quietly. Um, and it's this idea of quietness that we wanna talk about, um, undocumented queer and trans writers um, and in general undocumented artists have always been creating. Um, whether or not the publishing world or the museum world or the MFA world wants to acknowledge, acknowledge it, we've, we've been existing and creating um, and we're not the only ones, right? Um, for, 
for those of you who may not know, like, um, for example, Real Women Have, Scur Have Curves, which is a movie. It was first a play written by a formerly undocumented migrant. And the play was all about undocumentedness. The movie has nothing to do with being undocumented, but that play was written in the 90s and then it was sold in, in Hollywood. Um, so the, the uh, genealogy is larger than we can imagine. Yeah, so some, one of the things that we wanted to uplift is this uh, amazing um, diagram image uh, created by Built and Movement Project. And I feel like many, may, maybe some of you have seen it floating around on social media. And it's like this, this really powerful image that I think illustrates how our movements, um, yeah, shout out to Deepa, uh, who like just created this um, visual image to, to kind of uplift the roles that many of us play into like this like social change ecosystem uh, where everyone has um, a role and no role is less or more important than the other person and i feel that when we think about on um, the trajectory of like um, undocumented youth organizing or just thinking about uh, our community or organizing in migrant spaces uh, artists have always been present um, and I think that when we're thinking about undocumented writers, um, one of the things is that many of us uh, met like 2009, 2010, like we've been around um, and in pocket holes as organizers or um, as coordinators, uh, as people drafting policies, um, doing um, deep, you know, fighting deportation cases. And, and so wanted to name that, that artists and cultural workers are present, um, have always been present in our movements. And I think that um, this image really like, it just, it is one of my favorites that uplifts like the roles of all of us. Um, and, and one of that being like storytellers. Um, and another thing we wanted to uplift is that we are not coming, you know, there's a lot of um, infrastructures and support for MFA writers and like published um, uh, artists and writers, um, but, undocumented folks, undocumented artists, artists with an undocumented experience um, have been creating uh, regardless of, and I think Alam touched this earlier, like we've been creating regardless of like if there was infrastructures or support. Uh, and many of those infrastructures are never gonna be enough or are gonna be the right spaces. And so we have been creating outside of the traditional um, formula of what it means to be an artist. Um, and because we're focusing on like undocu writers, the literary space has not been, um, I think for in general, the literary space is very like white and has never made spaces for um, writers of color. And I think that um, that has been the case with like undocumented writers where we have had to create our own spaces, our own retreats, our own writing workshops, our own journals and zines. And regardless if you know it is archived somewhere, um, it, it exists. And so we wanted to make sure that um, as we're talking and having this open conversation about our own craft, that we did not arrive here alone and that ecosystem is still thriving and still there. Um, and so many folks um, that were in, in, in community with are creating beautiful multidisciplinary work that maybe doesn't have a mainstream label or is can categorize nicely and, and perfect in a box um, and, and acknowledged by many of this like established spaces. Because um, we don't want to be, you know, like acknowledged by these spaces. Like the act of us being an artist and creatives is, is our own terms. Uh, but yes, so feel free um, to follow the Built in Movement project. Um, and yeah. And we wanted to um, like share what, what the ecosystem um, looks like. And we each have selected two um, writers, artists that we want to highlight. Um, and I'll talk about um, Pascal Lucindo Boison and Gladys von der Chiquitao Damascus. So um, Gladys von der Chiquitao Damascus, who is on the right hand side at the end, um, I met Gladys. Um, in 2011, when I was, no, in 2010, when I was recruiting high school youth for Dream Act votes to justify a Congress, um, a little tragic, but 
Gladys was one of the first people that I ever met in the movement who showed up to a meeting and she was like, um, I'm a writer. I don't want to testify. What do you want as, What do you want me to do as a writer? And I was like, shit, like, this is so important to have somebody show up and be like, no, 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 no. My contribution is my art. My contribution is not like some form of like surrogate storytelling. Um, and Gladys has been creating um, for the last 10 years. Um, Gladys works at the intersections of um, photography Photography, collage, watercolor, and poetry, and self-published the book, There's the Truth and There Are Other Things, and is currently self, uh, about to release uh, a second book, which is also self-published. Um, and the important thing about Gladys is that Gladys, um, all of her work has been in local newspapers. So um, she lives in Massachusetts and she's really invested um, in working with local media to get the stories out there of migrant communities. She's not necessarily invested um, in anything quote unquote larger or anything that's quote unquote about visibility because for her, the material realities of the law change state by state. And as a writer, the most impact that she feels she can make is in her local state. So I think that that's a really important way in which to think about the role of the migrant artist. Um, and Gladys is um, from Kenya um, and is queer. Um, and yeah. And the another writer that I want to lift up is Pascal Lucine de Boisson, who is actually um, has only been in the US for a very short time. So Pascal Lucine de Boisson was undocumented in 10 countries before coming to the United States. Um, he was undocumented first in Brazil and then kept moving up to the uh, up to like northern countries. Um, and he self, he published a memoir um, in 2019 titled Sobrevivientes Ciudadanos del Mundo when he was in Mexico. Um, he was living in Tijuana and he pretty much um, was speaking out loud in a um, Haitian Creole mixed with Spanish and somebody was helping him translate his story into Spanish. Um, and the, the memoir kind of details what it means to be running away from immigration police in Costa Rica, in Colombia, in Peru, in Ecuador. Um, and really thinking about the connections between the slave trade and colonialism in the Americas, because it isn't until until like the fifth or sixth country where he's undocumented in that he realizes that he's a descendant of slaves, and he kind of begins to wonder if um, like his descendants had to go through this in order to live a livable life in the Americas. And he is now based in Florida, um, and is and has like joined an ecosystem of undocumented writers in the U.S. Thank you, Alain. Um, and um, I think there's like links to the artists that are being put in the chat. So if you're interested in following their work or finding more about them, please go and also like support their work and buy their like self-published books because that's important. Um, I wanted to share Stacey Ann Chen and uh, Stacey Ann, if you're not familiar with her work, um, is an incredible Jamaican writer, uh, memoirist, um, Broadway writer. Um, and the reason why I wanted to uplift their work is because they were one of the first writers um, that came that I came across um, in New York City. Um, and in New York City is like, you know, this like the space of like spoken word and um, Def Jam and a lot of the work that um, her early work began in the spoken word space. Um, but one of the reasons that um, that Stacey and is just an incredible person in our ecosystem uh, because she's always been um, given and um, and wanting to mentor emerging writers and artists. And so when there was an opportunity to put together an docu writing retreat in 2013, um, Stacey Ann was like all in. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to uplift is like part of being in an ecosystem is that um, 
as we're maturing in our craft, um, there are emerging writers and like, how do we, it's not about being gatekeepers, it's about sharing and redistributing like our resources and our knowledge. Um, and Stacey Ann has been like pivotal in that part. Um, two incredible books that you should um, get and read is her 2009 memoir is The Other Side of Paradise, um, which is her transition from Jamaica into New York City. Um, uh, intergenerational relationships with her family, um, and also her latest book, uh, Crossfires, A Litany for Survival. And I think that um, Stacey Ann continues to be a faculty member of Vona Voices, which is one of the um, only writing um, conference uh, for writers of color um, nationally. And I think that um, Stacey Ann is just an incredible person who has like really shown and embodied like what it is to mentor um, next generation of writers. Um, the other person that I wanted to also speak about is Mariela Mendoza. Um, they are a Salt Lake City um, multidisciplinary artist from Peru. Um, and I think that when we're thinking about writers and artists and cultural workers, and when people think about um, migrant writers, it's like, um, you're supposed to only talk about migration in a specific um, way um, and to deviate from that is like you, you're not talking about migration, um, but Mariela's work has been uh, of like climate change and ecological change, and I think that um, not only are they writing and creating poetry, um, they use visual art to um, to really push this um, this like um, intersections of climate and migration um, as somebody who's undocumented and who's living in Salt Lake City and who has seen um, the devastation that has happened in Peru as well. And so Mariela is another incredible person. Um, and they also use um, utilize social media. Um, they're an anarchist. And I feel that oftentimes uh, in many migrant spaces or uh, mainstream spaces, um, there are certain politicals um, and ideologies that are like uh, uplifted or brought up into the space. And so, um, yeah, so wanted to give a shout out to both of these incredible writers because they've just been creating work, um, whether it's working intergenerational with different writers or at the intersection of climate change. Um, and they and Mariela does then sell their work all the time on social media. So if you have some coins, please go and support their work. Thank you, Sonia. I'm gonna um, stop sharing and then I'll share the last slide um, in a little bit. Um, okay, so we wanted to um, ask each other um, some questions. Um, and part of this is because it's like, there wasn't ever a toolkit for us of how to be like migrant artists or migrant writers. Um, oftentimes, like my mom and my family would be like, okay, so like, what are you gonna do for money? Like, how are you gonna live? You can't just be writing poems. Um, and now, even though they don't really know what I do, they tell like my family members, tell people that I'm a journalist and I'm like, I am not a freaking journalist. But it's because they feel more confident saying that I'm a journalist as opposed to saying that I'm a poet. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but... um. Sonia, um, I wanted to ask you if you can um, talk about the value of self-publishing and what it went to producing your first chapbook, Nostalgia and Borders. Thank you, Alain, um, for that question. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to self-publish my own chapbook is because I was applying for so many like chapbook contests and I was not getting them. Um, and or the requirements for them were specifically, you know, like focus on having a literary resume. Um, and yeah, so it, it, it just didn't feel like uh, my writing could live in those spaces. And I wanted to create um, my poetry and collection in a form that can live, that it felt good for me, that it was aligned with, um, with what I wanted my poetry to look like and how to land in people's hands. And so I self-published it in 2006, uh, 2016. And I, I'm so grateful for like the undocumented artists um, that are part of my chosen family circle. Uh, and that's Emilia Fiaggio and Romy Torico. Um, Emilia Fiaggio is 
um, a writer teacher from Brooklyn and Romy Torico from Florida, who's a visual artist. And they both help design to lay out. I'm not like, as much as I say, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, my Adobe like in design, in, it's, it's shit. So I lean on them to help me organize my chapbook um, to see how like it can be a work of art itself. Um, and Amelia helped, you know, just copy edit if there were grammar commas or something that was not aligning. Um, but it was a work of love. It was a work that came out of like working with other undocumented artists and visual artists. Um, because yeah, like um I think that's part of like the work that we're doing is like working from and within community. And then we have resources partnering up with folks that that look like us or that are at the intersection of some of our experiences. And so that was Nostalgia and Borders, um, my first chat book. And so far my last chat book, uh, because it was a hard process. And simultaneously, I was also um, just been like um, doing more cultural institution and, um, and um, infrastructure. Um, but I do recommend anyone, like we don't have to wait for publishing companies. We don't have to wait for anybody to give us permission to write or to put our, our works out there. Um, and it could look in so many different ways. Um, and I also come from a school of like self-publishing is also as valuable as a formally published book by like a big company. Like fuck that shit, like, you know, we can remain with our, with our right to our writings um, and we create we can create the most wonderful books um, in-house like we can do that um, and we don't need no, nobody's permission so that was my process I'm not sure if I answered that um, the best way um, but Alain I have a question for you as well um, you have been putting out so much amazing incredible work and I'm wondering like how does how does your manuscript process like begin and end like what it, what is that um, because I'm, I'm stuck there. <laughs> awesome, thank you, you know. Um, I often say that I never know that I'm writing like anything except for like an individual poem. Um, and then I end up um, with a whole bunch of pieces in either a Google Drive or Word documents, but more, re more lately than not, most of my poems are on the notes section on my phone. Um, and what I like, when I feel like I have something like that's somewhat thematically around the same thing, I print out all of the pieces and then I kind of like read through them all. And what I started to do is I tape every single poem to the wall um, because for me, it's like super visual. It's about like, could this be something? Could it be a chat book? Could it be a book? Or could it be uh, something else? Could it be like a manifesto? And once I have everything on the wall, I feel like that motivates me to do something else because every day they're just like in my room until I figure out what they're gonna be. And I'm looking at them every day. I might not be reading them every day, but just knowing that all these poems exist remind me of like, oh yes, like you're a writer and you have a lot of work that nobody has ever seen. Um, and that's always for me the first step. And afterwards I begin to thematize it. Um, and it's not about telling a story. I don't think Think that books have to tell stories. The expectation that a book has to tell a story is one for a lazy reader, two for um, like massive consumption. Like I don't want my poems to be massively consumed. I want people to like critically care for my work. And if it doesn't tell a story for it to be as valuable as if it was telling a linear story. I think that linearity is not something, it's, it's something like super like heterosexual um, that I'm like, okay, girl, <laughs> bye. Um, but it's about like, okay, like when I say thematizing, I'm like, okay, some of these poems are about maybe family. Some of these poems are about plays. Some of these things are about like visions. Um, that's what I mean by theme, not of like middle, beginning and end. I mean, you know what I mean. Um, and once I thematize them together, I begin to just like, I, I bind them. So I'll usually go to Staples or something, bind them all together. And then I'll just like carry them around in my um, tote bag everywhere I go. And whenever I feel like, oh, like I wanna edit something or I feel inspired because I usually don't feel inspired to edit, but I always have them bound in a tote bag uh, so that when I'm somewhere and have the time to look at them, I can just like edit them um, there. Um, and my thing is never throw away any 
poems that you've revised because sometimes like the middle revision might be the best sometimes the final revision might like not be um the poem you want the world to see sometimes the final revision is the poem that you want to see for yourself but it might be too personal so keep another revision to remain the right uh for people not to know certain things about your life um and with this sonia i also want to talk about like um like what advice did you wish that someone gave you when you began your career as a writer and interdisciplinary artist? I'm over here like, yes, uh, linearity is heterosexual. Um, I think the best advice I wish I could have received was that it doesn't have to look a particular way. Um, and I feel like often still now it is so ingrained in me. I'm like, oh, I have to be a writer and look this certain way. My poetry has to look like this. It should still be, you know, like, um, and that's okay. Like sometimes I'm not a writer. Sometimes I'm just a photographer. Sometimes I'm just thinking about like sustainability and clothing, um, or sometimes I'm just resting. And I think that that's okay. Um, and taking a pauses or shifting a little bit from like a specific medium um it's okay like we can still be existing as writers or artists as whatever medium you know we lean on and i think that um for me the unnamed genre or the unnamed medium that i may be like leaning on right now um even though it might be unnamed that is still valid and still exists um so that's like one advice i wish like other folks would have um, uh, pushed on me. Like, it's okay to to be a writer in whatever format, in whatever way. Um, and yeah, so if you wanna pick up, you know, being a memoirist, go. If you wanna crochet, like, do it. Like, that's okay. That doesn't take away from you being a writer. And so, um, yeah. And Alan, your last, the last question that I have for you is, how do you nurture your creative muscles? Um, I feel that um, I, I want to know, how are you nurturing your creative muscles? Absolutely. So um, I was never the kind of girl that was into music. Um, I started listening to music in 2016. Literally prior to 2016, the only music I listened to was the CD collection my mom had that I put onto my laptop before I moved to California. So that's the only music I would ever listen to. And now I feel like music is the thing that saves me. I can literally um, listen to, to music and feel like life has been resurrected in me. Um, Right now, Mabilan, who is a queer Afro-Colombian singer, um, she, she released her latest um, album last week. And oh my goodness, it is so fucking good. Um, she's actually gonna be um, like two miles away from where I live right now next week. So I'm gonna go uh, try to interview her. <laughs> um, but music has um, been incredible for me as well as um, like short films. I can sit through like a full movie, I get really bored, but short films, I think um, they're so concise and there's something about um, the ability of a, a writer to get so much across when all they have is 15 minutes on screen, right? I learn a lot about dialogue in those moments because it's like, you can't like have casual conversations on film, right? Like nobody fucking wants to see that on a screen unless it's integral to the storyline. And I think that the more short films I watch, the more concise my poetry is. Um, Cause that's what I used to struggle with. I used to have these really long poems that I always felt could be split up into three different poems, but I didn't know how to actually revise them until I started watching short films. Thank you, Alan. Um, one person told me once um, uh, I did something similar, like just write pages and pages. And they're like, um, it's this place of like, do you think this is your last poem? Um, and so I was like, I was like, okay. Um, so they're like, you know, like let your poetry live and like they can be in multiple, like multiple sections of different poems. Um, but yeah, so I feel you on the over overdrafting and overwriting many, many pages, which is okay too. Um, but yes, yes, two videos. Um, 
I know that we are at time, but we did want to make space for questions uh, from folks on the chat. Um, yeah, like if you have questions, if you wanted to ask Alan or myself, or just throw a question out to the larger like community of artists who are present here, like all of you who are joining, like I think um, there's so much knowledge here um, that we welcome. So yeah, and thank you for the chat um, links. I'm gonna go listen to the Spotify list. Okay, so um, Ariana wrote, I would be interested in hearing about any creative projects you're currently working on or thinking about making. Sonia, would you like to go first? I'm like, you. Um, <laughs> <sure. laughs> um, so I've been working on this ontology, uh, Somewhere We Are Human, uh, um, and it has many of my favorite people in there. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Um, that comes out uh, later at the end of the year. Um, so that's one project. Um, and I'm working on this installation um, around grief. Um, and what? yeah, um, and it's gonna be in the hills of like Malibu, um, which if you're in California or in the LA area and um, well, backstory to this is that um, during the pandemic, I've lost many like um, folks um, to COVID. Um, and so I feel like there's been as much as we've been inside and, and socially distancing, like there hasn't been a moment to like really process all the things on top of all the things. And so um, I was asked to do some type of an installation um, in this Jewish um, space uh, facility that got burned down in the 2018 wildfires. Um, and it's like, it's just burnt out. Um, and so I'm using that opportunity to just make a space um, to just grieve and grieve a lot of um, childhood trauma and and just hold space. Um, and there might be a section where I'm going to be bringing in other artists and cultural workers um, just to like to have a space for us to grieve and and share a meal. Um, so if you're in LA or in the California near LA, uh, and if you want to be part of that and just like have a moment to grieve, um, let me know. Like. Um, so I think those are two projects. And then um, I'm just trying to live. Like, I, I, I feel like that is, has been the biggest project of my life for the past couple of years. And to be here and, and, and breathing and, um, and trying to survive capitalism. Um, but yeah, so that's what I'm working on and internal work with my therapist. Um, and yeah, Alan, what about you? What are the amazing projects you're working on? Wow, thank you for that, Sonia. I'm excited for your installation. I'm also like angry that you have to create that kind of work, um, you know? Um, like there should be better infrastructure for us to have survive, for all of our family members and friends who have survived the pandemic. Um, I think that like, over the last two years, I've been thinking a lot about um, my vision for the future and also like my lack of vision for the future when I was a younger organizer. Um, and right now I think that um, for December, I wanna release like a limited edition chat book. I only wanna print a hundred copies, um, but I wanna do this like thing where it's only a hundred copies and it's only available in December. Um, <laughs> So I am going to be working on that here um, and obviously I'll be like handwriting and, and designing it here. Um, I'm based in Mexico City um, so yeah like it'll all be based here um, 
and the chapbook will be poems about the future um, and also some stuff that I've written that like nobody has seen that I just has, haven't felt like there's been a good place for them to be in, um, but yeah. Um, and then does anybody else have any other questions? Like they can be as specific as you want or like as general as you um, desire. <clears throat> oh my goodness. One another answer too. <laughs> Rather than said, I want to know what your game plan is for getting this interview with Maviland. You know what? I'm just like, today and tomorrow, I'm going to be pitching to a whole bunch of magazines and interview. And once they say yes, I can like reach out to her um, PR team. And if they do not reach out, she does have a really small concert here. I think the venue like can hold 50 people. Um, I, did get a, I did get two tickets for it. Um, so I'm going to make sure to just like, if they don't reach out, I'ma just get there really early and leave as late as I need to until like be like, hey, let me interview you tomorrow. <laughs> so that's the plan so far. <laughs> A direct action, correct. <laughs> I love the awkward silence, so, you know, um, but Laura, yes. We can, I mean, we can definitely sit in the awkward silence. I'm happy, definitely happy to sit in here with y'all. Um, but I know that, yeah, thanks y'all for being so generous with your time and for giving us such a gift of your presence and your words um, and your existence here. Um, I think there is a, oh yeah, there's some things um, you're sharing. Yeah, we could get some like, some gratitude in the chat, um, some favorite parts. Uh, go ahead and you can start throwing that in the chat now. Um, but I do want to make sure that we do get a break um, before the next event at 6.30. And I think we had a few just closing slides um, to present. And again, we can send, let me send also uh, a reminder to also send, send love in the chat, but also you can send love through buying uh, Alan and Sonia's work. Uh, so here is Sonia's chat book again, um, and then Alan's books. Let me send in the chat. Yeah, send love in any way that you can. Um, and do we have a few more slides just for advertising our future events? I'm not sure who is the screen here. Awesome. Um, you can find us on most of the socials. Um, it is um, at the Sonia G on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And then it is at Migrant Scribble on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and then also like we attached our Venmos. Um, but yeah, thank you so much y'all for coming through today. Yeah, thank you, Alan, the coordinators. Um, also, Diego, the translator. Uh, thank you so much for doing that important work. Uh, and I did want to emphasize that um, the posters for, for Mariposa Sin Fronteras um, are still like you know uh, around. There's so many, so please go buy and purchase them. Get get it for your living room. Get it for your cousin's living room. Get it for your view. You know, for your boo or view. Um, and thank you everyone, really appreciate it. And, um, and if you're joining us for the writing workshop, it's gonna be in about less than 30 minutes. Um, but thank you and, and thank you everyone and, and Q and all the coordinators.
Yeah, thanks all so much. Those are great apples. The next event will be at 6.30 and it will be the same Zoom link. So feel free to stay on or log off if you have the same Zoom link. Um, you pretty much, yeah, <laughs> the, um, kept it up well. So we'll be back in 19 minutes unless some, someone has any closing thoughts. No, I just wanted to okay. say briefly um, that we'll also, we have our fourth and final event on July 29th. I was trying to share my screen, but my computer's being very bad right now. Um, but uh, we have a, a round table discussion and a party uh, with DJ Funky Caramelo, Franco Villaton, um, Danilo, the iconic Danilo Machado is <laughs> moderating. Um, and we have Julio Salgado, Ola Osase. Um, we have, um, who else is Laura and Danilo help me out? Um, we have Wo Chan, an incredible um, Pearl Harbor, uh, also known as Pearl Harbor, and Angelica Becera. Um, so it's going to be lit. So if you're not staying, sticking around for the Creative Writing Workshop, we still love you. And we hope to see you on the 29th. Um, please help us spread the word. Um, and I can share my screen and show you all if you want a little glimpse of the poster before you head off for your break. Um, and then Danilo, I'm just, um, D, or slash DJ Queer Shoulders. I don't know if you want to um, put you on the spot, but I don't know. Danilo also is an incredible DJ. This, um, I didn't, I was through, throwing so much shade at Danilo when they started DJing at the beginning of the pandemic, um, but now I'm a fan. And so I don't know if you want to um, also give us some, some music while we, um, in between the, the two events. Um, but, um, but let me share my screen so you can get a glimpse of this beautiful poster that we commissioned from, from Julio. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna play some of Avan's rec. I'm like very excited to hear, to have a new artist to listen to. So I'm gonna play some of that. Yeah, but just so you all can see, this is a beautiful poster. Um, so I hope you're, if, and Daniel, I don't know if you can drop the link. I know you're multitasking, but if you could drop the link again where you can order your own copy of this uh, again, um, as Sonia mentioned, get for you yourself or for your boo. Um, I can't think of a better gift. So I just need to find a boo that I can get it for. <laughs> All right, I'll stop being messy. Daniel will take it away. Aletosa, pa' la calladita que es... Bailadito, yeah, that's what it is, baby. Bailadito, mami, gracias, mami, gracias. Check it, what? Check it, what? Problemas tengo un poco ton, poco ton, pero por bacán, nunca por bocón, no, no, no. Uh. Yo no coopero con la popo, me quieren dar el tumbe por encender el copo, están locos. Uh -huh. eh, que estilito, que chimbita, yo tengo lumbre, pa' que derrita. Ay, come 